I'm Owen Big Line. This is the Inside Edge video blog. Just got back from a nice little luncheon here in downtown Vancouver with a, a colleague of mine who's also in the in the real estate business and has been for a long time. We'll meet every couple of months for lunch, talk about the state of the market right now and how his business is doing, how my business is doing, what are we seeing from the front lines, that kind of thing. But you know, we got into a, an interesting conversation that I wanted to share with you guys here. We, we talked at length about how some people, uh, you know, seem to rise above things and have you know great levels of success while other people struggle and uh, we all know people personally I've got lots of friends that I've gone to school with over the years some have risen to incredible heights and others have fallen by the wayside and I'm sure my viewers uh, have the same thing family members friends relatives some achieve success, some don't. And why is it so difficult for some people just to get ahead financially? And, you know, I think it really comes down to what I talk about in the first couple chapters of my book. If, you, if you've read my book, you know that I kind of set the stage with my book about the mental uh, uh, attitude, the psychology you need to have to be successful. And these isn't things that it's, it's theory. This is practical things that I've not only put to work myself, but I've learned from other people. Very successful mentors that I've had over the years, and also the hundreds and hundreds of books that I've read over the years. But it basically comes down, and I've blogged about it quite a number of times, two types of people. I call them the doers and the donters, and there's no middle ground. You're either a doer, you're can do, you're positive, you're optimistic, or you're a donter. You're waiting for someone else to bail you out, to help you, like the government, and you complain a lot about things. Everyday complaining is a, another wasted day, and unfortunately, some people will have a day of revelation. They will figure it out. That, you know, this complaining's not getting me anywhere, and nobody's gonna help me except me. I've gotta do it myself, and what I call doing the mirror test. Standing in front of the mirror and being honest with yourself. Uh, there's the other, the doers and donters, and then what I call the investors or the speculators. And there's only two types. And I set the table in my book about how you need to have the investor mindset over the speculator mindset. And I see the speculator mindset come out again and again when I see some of the comments on my YouTube channel. They just don't get it. They talk about how, hey, this market's overheated, it's in a bubble, it's gonna drop 50, 60, 70%. Well, that's fine. If that's what you think, then by all means, I would wait. Uh, I guess what you're suggesting as well, though, is I own a lot of real estate, as people know, in downtown Vancouver and Richmond. Uh, I guess I should sell all my investment properties now while they're getting good, cash out, sell my principal residence too, because it's quite substantial and I just did a big reno on it. I guess I should sell all that, wait for a better time, and then buy back in. So this is something that I've heard for over 20 years in Vancouver real estate. The last time we had this in 2012, it was the same thing. Sell everything you've got, you're crazy, cash it out and buy back when the mar after the market's finished crashing. But it's not the way it works. If you read my book, and I'm not gonna get into it here, you know, that is a speculator short-term mindset. You have to have the investor mindset. I mean, I've got good tenants paying me fat rent checks right now. Why would I sell, lose, lose the goose that's laying the golden eggs for me, and then have the potential of buying back in? You know, the other thing people need to realize, and this is coming from a realtor, me, who makes my living buying and selling real estate. Real estate is an extremely expensive asset to buy and sell. It takes time to sell a house, and it's expensive to sell a house. You've got commissions that I, I'm going to be looking for to sell it. You've got your notary fees. When you're buying back, you've got property transfer tax, which is brutal. It's the biggest tax grab going. You might have GST. You've got more lawyers and conveyancing fees. You know, it can take a year or more to liquidate a real estate portfolio and cost you hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's not like liquidating a stock portfolio where you could liquidate a stock portfolio. I could liquidate my stock portfolio here in five minutes and it'd cost me about $250. Real estate isn't an asset that you move in and out of like a stock is. But, you know, we had a good discussion and, and you know, it's this, it boils down to the speculator versus investor mindset. And in my book, 
The first two chapters, I set the table on the attitude you have to have, and that's the make or break it with my book. If you can't get through those first couple of chapters, then the rest of the book isn't going to do you much good. You're not going to pick up what I'm putting down. You're not going to understand how it works. And, you know, I'll give you a side story here. I'm not going to give you the name of the newspaper here, but there's a newspaper, Canadian newspaper, uh, that has been good to me over the years. They profile many of my sales over the years in Vancouver. They've done profiles on me as an investor. Certain reporters there have. But there's a, a real estate reporter that works for the paper, and I follow her on Twitter. I'm a gut glutton for punishment. And over the last two years, all she has done is, uh, is complain uh, lay the finger on everybody else but herself. The government is to blame, the liberals were to blame, the foreign buyers, the banks, the realtors, the dirty realtors. Everyone is to blame except for her and not being able to buy a house. And she cherry picks these articles that she retweets over and over. It must be getting tough for her because man, she's really got to dig deep to get these articles in a lot of cases but never puts the blame on herself uh, or does the mirror test. And yes, I've blogged about it many times before. There are some things in the Vancouver real estate market, just like there is in the California market, the New York market, the London market, the Miami market, that isn't fair to some people. The foreign buyers and the abuse of the principal residence exemption. Um, you know, I've blogged about these things. But this is the way life is. It's not going to be perfect. You got to move forward. Every day you spend complaining, you're just wasting another day. But I decided, you know what, I'm going to make contact with her. I had her email address and I'm going to send her my book. And I, and I sent her a bo the book with a little note saying, hey, I hope you read this. Maybe, you know, you might enjoy it and it'll open your eyes a bit to, you know, the value of simply buying and holding real estate. I kind of in the note I said, you know, the Vancouver market's not perfect and hey, I agree with some of the things you've been tweeting here and hopefully we'll get some of these things straightened out in time. But don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Real estate will do some incredible things for you. So that was about six months ago. I never heard back from her whether she read the book. Uh, I have a feeling one of two things happened. She either never read the book, you know, along for the ride, getting your money to work for you through real estate and stocks, that's not in her mindset right now. She's mad, she's angry, she's pointing fingers. So one of two things happened. She put it on the shelf or threw it in the garbage. It's not of interest to her right now. It's not what she's about. Or she read the first couple of chapters and it was the mere test for her. And it wasn't what she wanted to hear and put the book down and never got past the first two chapters. And it's too bad, but you know what? Sometimes these people will come around. Sometimes eventually they just get burned out and tired of complaining and they come over to the, the they leave the dark side and come over to the light because there's, there's only two ways to go in life. There really is. You're either positive, you're either moving forward and putting everything on you. You're the one, you control your own destiny, not the government, not the banks, not the finance minister not the Liberals, not the NDPs, it's you. People are making it every day and getting ahead in this market. I see it every day with my clients. I've got young clients, I've got clients that aren't pulling down six figures a year that are making it happen and buying their first condo in downtown or buying their first condo in New Westminster or in Richmond on SkyTrain. They're giving up the car, they're giving up going out to the Lions or Canucks games, and maybe a few dinners and they're making it happen. But once they get in, now they jump that huge hurdle and it's pretty much smooth sailing now. They're paying now to support that mortgage, not much more than what they were paying for rent. But I don't know how much more I can put it through to people. You're a doer or you're a donter. You're a speculator or you're an investor. And you've got to get your mind set right and think long term. Nothing's perfect in this world. Let me give you one final example here. Let's talk about, let's get away from Vancouver real estate and stock, talk about my other love, which is buying quality equities, quality companies that pay you a dividend. So I talk about it, I give you my portfolio in my book. We're talking companies like Apple, Costco, Visa, 
Johnson & Johnson, Merck, TD Bank, Royal Bank, Enbridge, Brookfield Asset Management, Procter & Gamble. These are companies that have been around for a long time, are incredibly profitable. They are spinning off tremendous amounts of free cash flow and they're rewarding it to you by sending you a check every three months. So, you know, people will talk about overheated markets and fear of missing out. Well, the TSX is at an all time high right now. Does that mean I shouldn't be investing in the TSX and putting money into my TFSA and my RRSP? Buy TD Bank today. Keep it for 20 or 25 years. You're going to do fantastic. If TD happens to go down 10% next year, who cares? It's in your RRSP and your TFSA and you're collecting a quarterly dividend, which you can reinvest into more stock. It's a really simple formula. It's rinse and repeat. It works. Don't try and overestimate or overanalyze everything or what I call getting cute and trying to time and getting in out of markets. It's not a good idea with stocks, but at least there you can buy and sell a stock for 10 bucks. It's a really dumb idea with real estate where it's costing you tens of thousands of dollars to get in and out of positions. And remember, I'm telling you that and that's how I make my living. I'm telling you to keep the damn thing. But give you one side load here and let's compare it to Vancouver real estate. Vancouver real estate, I've been in this business for 30 years, as you guys know. I've seen lots of bull runs and I've seen times where the market is dead and it's going down week over week. I talked about it in 2012. At one time, I think I was holding 10 listings in 2012. Uh, I wasn't even getting phone calls. I had to check my phone to see if it was on. It got so slow at one point, I had eight or nine listings. I took off down to a training camp down in California. Uh, to work out for a couple of weeks. The weather was great, nothing was going on while I was down there, so I stayed another week. But eventually it got its legs back and off she went again. The same thing is gonna happen here on the next cycle. Maybe we'll get a slowdown here, prices will start coming down this fall, maybe it'll slide for a year, who knows, maybe it'll level off, kind of flatline for a while, but eventually the market will go back into an up cycle and we'll start it all over again. So there will be good buying windows for you over the next 15 or 20 years. And if you want to wait for one, go ahead. But the same thing can be said with stocks. So when I see a company that I like, I own it and it goes on sale, or even if I just think it's reasonably valued, I'll buy it. But there are always tough times, even for the best companies in the world, fall on hard times and some people who are speculators dump it at the worst time only to find out later it was a temporary thing which it always is with these good companies and off they go again. I'll give you a final little example that if you go to business school most business schools will talk about this. It's about Johnson & Johnson. Johnson & Johnson, I've owned this company for 20 years. One of the greatest American companies, one of the greatest world companies you can buy. They've <laughs> incredibly well managed you buy some shares in Johnson Johnson today, tuck it away for 20 years, you're gonna be very happy with the results. But Johnson & Johnson has had some tough goes here and there. One of the ones that is famous is in, 19, in the 1980s, they had the Tylenol scandal. I'll keep it quick here, but people were dying by taking Tylenol, which is a Johnson & Johnson product. They weren't sure what was going on. Immediately though, you got people that will sell the stock dump the stock, Johnson & Johnson has done something here and they're killing people. Uh, the investigation continued on, they weren't sure if it was something at one of their plants, their, then it went to one of Johnson & Johnson's employees who was tampering the product. The stock was completely decimated. It lost something like 60 or 70 percent of its value. That would have been a time to buy it. Unfortunately, a lot of people sold it. These things will pass and they always do. As it turns out, there was some wacko that was tampering with the bottles, had nothing to do with Johnson & Johnson other than just tough luck. They happened to choose a Johnson & Johnson product to tamper with. Eventually it all got figured out and off the stock went. But many people sold that stock and took massive losses thinking the stock would never recover. I mean, at the time the headlines were Johnson & Johnson is gonna go bankrupt. The company is done. They're gonna get sued. They've been killing people. It's their fault. Johnson & Johnson, look at the stock price on it. There's been incredible buying windows. 
but you keep it, hold it, and look at those dips as good buying opportunities. They're going through the same thing right now. We've got a talcum powder lawsuit, class action lawsuit against Johnson & Johnson, which last week they won a preliminary uh, uh, a hearing on it, and the stock sold off five or six bucks. So it's been in the doldrums here for the last uh, two or three months, well off its highs. But I don't sell my Johnson & Johnson when these things happen because they're always temporary. As long as the fundamentals of the company are solid, which they are, and I keep an eye on those, you want to, then these things will pass and they can be good buying opportunities. But if you're a speculator, my God, you're, you're, you would be constantly buying and selling out of these positions for the slightest bit of news. The slightest bit of bad news and you're selling. It's crazy. You're selling it, paying the commissions to sell it, and then you're buying it back in later. It's, if, it's a fool's game. Buy the right companies and just hold on to them just like Vancouver Real Estate and you will do fantastic. Don't overcomplicate it by trying to be a market timer or a speculator. Speculators end up for the most part, it might take a few years, might take 10 years, but most traders end up getting their heads handed to them and lose all their money. Look it up. Investors that simply buy quality assets, don't buy anything. That doesn't mean you go and buy cryptocurrency or marijuana stocks or Tesla and hang on to it. Those aren't the right companies to be buying and holding. Buy, if you want to buy today or buy next year, buy a quality Vancouver condo or home or townhouse or buy something on SkyTrain. Get a good realtor, negotiate the, a, a good price for you, don't overextend yourself, allow for repairs and special levies and mortgage rate hikes. Buy it, live in it, enjoy it, and you're gonna do fantastic over the next 20 or 25 years, but certainly don't be trading in and out of your principal residence because you think the market is gonna go down. Some of the comments, people, it's just unbelievable. Playing games with your principal residence is about the dumbest idea I've ever heard. You sell your house when you have a need. You get transferred, you get a divorce, you're upsizing, downsizing. Those are fine reasons to sell. But you don't sell because you think just maybe the market's gonna go down 50% in the next two or three years. If you wanna play that game, go ahead and I sincerely wish you luck. But smart people don't play that game. If you haven't joined my YouTube blog and subscribed, please do. If you haven't bought my book, I'm going to try and plug it a bit here. Why not? Dog days of summer. Buy my book. It'll be the best $10 you've ever spent. I'm Owen Big Line. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next week.